great crowd we have here. This is so exciting. Uh, we're really excited tonight to welcome back Chelmsford native Kelly Beatty, who's been explaining the science and wonder of astronomy to the public since 1974. An award-winning writer and communicator, he specializes in planetary science and space exploration, and after 43 years of pounding the keyboard as senior editor, he retired from full-time work in early 2018, but remains actively involved in many Sky and Telescope magazine projects and articles. Tonight, for our first in our summer space series, he's going to guide us on an exploration of the rocky bodies floating in our orbit that we often refer to as asteroids. How are they formed? What are they like? And will one of them one day hit Earth with enough force to create widespread damage? The science and fiction will be explained tonight. Mr. Beatty has also brought along some examples of meteorites in the back for you to enjoy. Um, on your way out of the program. Uh, one of them is actually not a meteorite, so it's up to you to try and determine which one that is. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Uh, this is a really exciting time for me right now. Uh, in a nine days, my wife Cheryl and I leave for South America to the country of Chile where there will be a total eclipse of the sun. Now, some of you remember in 2017, there was this little thing that crossed the United States. Did any of you get to see the total eclipse? A few of you, yeah? Of course, it was clear here that day, so you saw a partial eclipse. Well, the next total solar eclipse anywhere is this one coming up. And it's on July 2nd, that's a Tuesday night, and it turns out within the last week, we found that a crew from ABC News is gonna be with our group. Uh, so if you tune in, um, those of you who watch ABC regularly, Rob Marciano, the meteorologist, is going to be with us. And so you'll get a ringside seat even though you're not actually there. But that's not our topic tonight. We're talking about uh, asteroids, which means star-like. And they're called that because when they were first discovered, as you'll see, they, they have, and, and remains the case, if you were to look at an asteroid in a telescope, it would look like a star. You would be hard pressed to distinguish it from another star. And so um, we're gonna go into that. You know, our solar system as a whole formed four and a half billion years ago, pretty much all at one time. Within about 10 million years or so, all the moving parts were in place. It seems like a long time, but on the scale of four and a half billion, it's you know, just a, a blink of an eye. And it's always amazing to me that uh, here's the sun uh, for scale. All of these are, are to scale. That with, from this one collapsing cloud of gas and dust, four and a half billion years ago, we got so many different and interesting planets, right? Earth is nothing like Jupiter. And Jupiter is nothing like Pluto, if we want to consider Pluto a planet still. And yet they all formed at pretty much the same time. Now. Historically, uh, astronomers, even with your unaided eye, you're able to see, in addition to Earth, which is here, you're able to see Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Jupiter, by the way, is really big and bright in our sky right now. Uh, someday, when it stops raining in New England, after sunset, do an about face and look on the opposite horizon east, and you'll see, if not right away, soon after sunset, a very bright star kind of all by itself. That is Jupiter. That is Jupiter. And if you're really patient, watch that same spot a couple of hours later and Saturn will rise. But Jupiter is really bright and very obvious right now. You can't miss it. So we knew of the planets out through Saturn. And uh, not until the invention of the telescope did, did uh, William Herschel discover Uranus and uh, um, uh, what was his name? Johann Galle discovered uh, Neptune. I think I got that right. Uh, so, after the discovery of Uranus here, it was um, imagined that uh, a couple of us uh, of theorists in Germany, um, Johann, uh, uh, Johann Titius and, I'm trying to think of the guy's name, Bode. Uh, Bode was kind of like his publicist. So, Titius is the guy who did the really smart thinking. You know, took a look at how objects orbit the sun and see, said, I see a pattern here. And the pattern is this rather simple uh, numerical relationship. So if Earth is one in this scheme, right, four plus six is 10 divided by 10 is one. 
There is the earth. 4 plus 3 is 7 divided by 10 is 7 tenths. So that's 7 tenths right here. 4 tenths is Mercury. Um, 1.6 is Mars. Jupiter is 5 away. So that's uh, 24 plus 8 divided by 10, 2.3. That one there, 24, 28 divided by 10, should be a planet here in this scheme. These are the dots that re represent the numerical answers. Jupiter has a dot, Saturn has a dot. After Uranus was discovered, it had a dot. So what was going on here? Astronomers concluded, therefore, this was such a good fit that there must be a, a, some kind of planet that had yet to be discovered between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. This was in the late 1700s. Now, the United States was just getting started then. So at that time, the center of astronomy was in Europe. And so, so a bunch of European astronomers got together with the intent of discovering this planet that seemed, most certainly must have been there. And they called themselves the Celestial Police. I am not making that up. <laughs> they were led by uh, uh, Baron uh, Franz Xavier von Zach. And sure enough, on New Year's Day in 1801, Giuseppe Piazzi, observing from Palermo in Sicily through a relatively small telescope, discovered an object that soon to be confirmed to be between Mars and Jupiter. Ta-da! Right? It turns out that was 1801. Within a couple of years, three more bright objects. So the first one was named Ceres, and the other three were Juno, Vesta, and Pallas were also discovered. Wow, it was a bonanza, not just one planet, but four, all about the same distance, midway between Mars and Jupiter. In fact, this is a textbook from 1830, and it's a list of all the bodies in the solar system. It's right after the discovery of Uranus, which at the time was still being called Herschel. They hadn't settled on a name yet. But here are those four bodies, and you might know that planets have their own little you know, kind of iconic symbol. So these all got their little symbols and they were included in tables of the planets. For all intents and purposes, those were planets. Now, it turns out, this was 1830, right after this book was published, astronomers started discovering asteroids, as we came to call them, by the dozens. And very soon we realized that there were, first of all, so many of them, and second of all, they were all pretty small based on how much light they reflected that they weren't really planets at all, but they were a class of bodies which came to be called minor planets that occupied that space between Jupiter and Saturn, uh, between Jupiter and Mars. And this is a kind of uh, artistic portrayal of some of the largest asteroids. This is Mars for scale. Mars is about half the diameter of the Earth. They're all different shapes and sizes. Some are darker, some are brighter, some have color, a hint of color to them. And, um, the, it, you know, it's a very complicated, busy place, the asteroid belt. This is the largest asteroid, Ceres. It's numbered one because that was the one that Piazzi discovered. It's about 600 miles across, right? About here, from here to uh, oh, Philadelphia, roughly. And um, it's, it's, uh, it, we have such a clear picture of it because NASA sent a spacecraft called Dawn, which went into orbit around it and mapped it. And in fact, uh, Dawn is still there now in orbit around this object. And we, it doesn't look like it on the surface, but apparently uh, Ceres is part water, and there might be a deep, briny ocean between a kind of rocky, icy crust, and then with a big, rocky center. This is the kind of stuff you can discover about an asteroid when you actually take the time and the expense to go visit it. Here's another asteroid that we've seen up close. This is called Vesta, also seen by the Dawn spacecraft. It's unusual because it has uh, deposits on its surface. You kind of see a darkish stain here. That's igneous rock. That's literally a volcanic eruption on the surface of Vesta. Very rare, very unusual. We knew this even before Dawn got there, but to see it up close is really impressive. This has been within the last 10 years we've gotten these pictures. And in fact, we've actually sent spacecraft to quite a few asteroids by now, well more than a dozen, close to uh, 20. And they range in size. Vesta and uh, Vesta is about 400 miles across. These are much, much smaller, right? This is Lutetia, which is about 100 miles across. 
uh, even less, maybe closer to 80, and they go down. And actually, there's one right here that's the very tiniest one. It's only about um, a third of a mile across. And this is what that little tiny speck looks like up close, recorded not by a NASA spacecraft. You know, we, we, we fall into this trap that NASA does all the space exploration in the world. This is by a Japanese spacecraft that, uh, called uh, Hayakawa uh, that actually landed on this asteroid uh, with the intent of returning a sample to Earth, which it did. It kind of had, didn't work exactly as planned, but it eventually came back to Earth and brought a little tiny particles of the asteroid with it so we could study it. So here is the International Space Station by comparison. And so this is, a, this is you know, it might be a small asteroid, but it's, it's big enough. And uh, Itakawa is actually a, what we call a near-Earth asteroid. It's an asteroid that can come, it ranges far away from the asteroid belt and actually comes close to Earth. And the reason for that is that we think of things orbiting the sun as having circular orbits. Earth's orbit is pretty darn circular, right? Mars is a little out of shape, but when you get really elongated orbits, they can come very close to the sun, the objects can come very close to the sun and front to far away. And many asteroids have those kinds of orbits, and we call those near-Earth asteroids if their orbit comes anywhere close to our own. So, we're going to zoom in on that zone. This is the big picture of our solar system uh, as recorded just about a week ago. Here, here's the orbit of Neptune. There's uh, Uranus, Saturn, and Jupiter. The sun is in the middle there. Here's Pluto. These red and white objects are all part of what's called the Kuiper Belt. The Kuiper Belt was um, theorized to exist back in 1950 and was only about beginning in the 1980s and since that we have come to realize that there, there are millions of objects out there and Pluto is just one of them. The existence of this Kuiper Belt directly led to the demotion of Pluto from planethood to dwarf planethood. And in fact, uh, these white dots are special. Pluto is in a special relationship with Neptune. Pluto goes around the sun twice Every, in the time it takes Neptune to go around three times, they're locked in a kind of resonance. And all the white dots there are similarly in a two to three resonance with Neptune. So Pluto is large, but it's not particularly special from a dynamical point of view. You can see there's a lot of objects. So we're going to zoom in now. Now this is the orbit of Jupiter, Mars, Earth, Venus, and Mercury. The, the sort of pay, uh, uh, lime green dots represent what we call the main belt of asteroids. We were about 750,000 of them that we know not only have identified, but have good orbits for them. We know where they are at all times. You notice along Jupiter's orbit that there are two bands. Here's a purplish band here, and here's one here. And in this scheme, Jupiter is right here. Uh, those are called Trojan asteroids. They actually travel around Jupiter's orbit with Jupiter a big clump of them ahead of it and behind it. They're kind of gravitationally locked into those positions. And they are very interesting objects. They're mostly dark. NASA has a mission uh, that will eventually, within the next few years, go out and visit a couple of those. But I want you to notice how crowded it looks inside that orbit of Jupiter. And we're going to zoom in one more. Now, here's the Earth's orbit. Here's Mars. Here's the sort of traditional edge of the main asteroid belt, and look at all the asteroids that can be found. This is a snapshot. This is where they are right now in the inner part of our solar system. And you think, well, how come we're not getting hit by, you know, 100 every day? Well, the symbols are really big, right? This from here to here is 100 million miles. So the asteroids are really quite small. Space is a really big place. And so they don't run into each other or us very often, but there are plenty of them out there. And so the issue will become at later in the talk is, uh, what is the chance that we might get hit with an asteroid? We'll get to that. First, I'd like to show you this kind of interesting animation, which shows just for near-Earth asteroids, this is developed by NASA, um, how, our, how the, the discovery of near-Earth asteroids has improved since 1999. That's how many we knew. Here's Earth's orbit, and there's Mars. This is 2009, 
right? Now here's 2018. We're getting very good at discovering these asteroids, right? And, and now this is all asteroids, including the near-Earth ones. The near-Earth ones are, co are colored blue. And it's, you know, it's, it's a lot to keep track of. And believe it or not, the world's centers for, there are three. The world centers for keeping track of where asteroids and comets are. Uh, there's one in, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. There's one in Italy. And there's one in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the Harvard Observatory. And so uh, that's, that's where the, all of the uh, clearinghouses. So those are asteroids. Now we're going to talk about what happens when asteroids visit the Earth. Since his, historic times, we, we have records of weird things happening in the sky, right? with things falling out of the sky. This is a, a, a woodcut, you know, this is a sort of end of the world scenario. We're all gonna die. And, and there have been like really intense meteor showers throughout history. Sometimes those meteors make it to the ground. And when they do, we call those meteorites and they're stony objects. The first confirmed record of a meteorite falling from the sky and being found was in November of 1492, just a couple of weeks after Columbus discovered America, right? Uh, in the little town of Vincesheim, France, uh, this is a woodcut showing this uh, thunderstone falling from the sky, and here is the single Vincesheim meteorite. It weighs 280 pounds. It's a big one. And it came down with a thud. It's on a special pedestal in a special room in a special building in Ensisheim, France. If you ever get there, stop by and say hi. Here was one, somewhat later, in 1807, that fell a little bit closer to home in Weston, Connecticut. This was observed to fall. Sometimes we see meteorites fall and we can go and pick them up, and sometimes we just kind of discover them. This was what was called an observed fall. We know exactly when it came. And so because it was in Connecticut, Yale sent a, co a couple of astronomers to investigate and collect eyewitness reports of it falling to the ground and so forth. And uh, word of this reached Thomas Jefferson, who was then president in the White House. Right? Thomas Jefferson, you know, was very scientifically literate. He knew a lot about science. He owned a telescope, uh, which he did not have the White House. That stayed behind at Monticello. But still, he was very much into science. And yet, he was not a believer. I'd sooner believe that two Yankee professors would lie than the stones would fall from heaven, he said. <laughs> well, he got one thing wrong. Got most things right, you got that one wrong. Now, fast forward again, this is uh, 1992, 500 years almost to the day after the Ensisheim fall. And uh, it, it occurred uh, on a Friday night up the coast of New England after dark. Lots of people were out at football games with those big boxes that, w that you can actually record video with. You know, they sit on your shoulder uh, with video cameras. and this object came screaming across the sky, south to north, very obvious, broke into pieces, and, um, and it was quite a spectacle. Meanwhile, in Peekskill, New York, a young girl, 16 years old, just had her first car, heard this loud thud, went outside to investigate, and found out that her car was totaled. Now, you can see the damage, and underneath the car was a single stone which came to be called the peak skill meteorite. Don't feel too bad for her, because meteorites that have fallen from the sky are quite valuable, and those that conk a car? <laughs> so she and her family sold the meteorite and the car to a meteorite collector for $70,000. So she did all right by that. Now, more recently, we had an event over Russia, uh, the uh, medium-sized city of Chelyabinsk, uh, in central Russia, and this was before dawn. Now, it's about 9 o'clock in the morning. You can see the time here, 9.20. But, you know, in, in, when you get far enough north in the middle of winter, it stays dark until, until very late. So this, oops, this is supposed to be a video. Let's see if it will play. There we go. This is a dash cam. Lots of Russians have dash cams because there's so much corruption. They, uh, they, have, uh, they have cameras in their dashboard. 
So here we go. He's stopping here. People are walking their way to work. And then this happens. Pedestrians, they don't much care. They just keep walking. So that was, I want you to pay close attention to that, to that path, kind of a glancing path through the atmosphere. Right? It land, this was the Chelyabinsk meteorite because it left meteors. Uh, it, it delivered, you know, uh, energy equals um, uh, mass times the velocity, one half mass times the velocity squared. So, more mass you have, the faster it's going, the more energy it delivers. And this delivered 440 kilotons equivalent of TNT, which is roughly 20 to 25 times the power of the atomic bomb that we dropped on Hiroshima. And so the fact that it had this glancing blow like this was really fortunate because I don't know if you remember this, there was a big shock wave that followed. What happened was people saw this, they were already at work, it was nine o'clock in the morning, and they went running over to the windows to see what was going on. And then the shock wave hit, it broke all the windows and everybody got cuts, a lot of cuts that day, thousands of people. Uh, but it was very powerful. Uh, astronomers estimate that it was about 50 meters across right, roughly the size of the old Adams Library part, uh, and that objects of that size strike the Earth about once every 50 years, on average. And, it, and this was, they were able to reconstruct the orbit, and this is one of those elongated elliptical orbits I was talking about that extends back into the asteroid belt and comes close to Earth, actually inside the Earth's orbit, and pow, that's where it, ha that's where it hit us. Now, there were a bunch of different pieces that landed, uh, it was frozen, you know, it was the middle of, of the winter, all the lakes were frozen. Here's a big hole created by one, a chunk of that meteorite. And later on, several months later, they, they it's very deep, and they discovered that uh, there was a big object, and this should be a video of them recovering it. The wind's going on in the cold off to the side here. The divers loaded it out. That's what it looks like. The rock, a piece of an asteroid hitting the Earth from direct delivery from the asteroid belt. So <clears throat> meteorites, these pieces of asteroids, hit the Earth all the time, every day, all over the Earth. No place is special. Uh, and most of them, by the large predominant fraction of them, more than three quarters of what are called ordinary chondrites. These are pieces of stone that collected at the beginning of the solar system. They're very old, four and a half billion years old. There are other special kinds. I'll show you a couple of examples. Carbonaceous chondrites are rich in carbon. Achondrites, stony irons, and irons are all have melted at some point. Uh, and so ordinary chondrites have never melted. They have the original texture when they formed. Achondrites have melted somewhere along the way. So this is what Oh, an ordinary chondrite looks like. It has this sort of, this is not crystals so much as it is little particles that are stuck together, right, of different compositions. And uh, this one is from Northwest Africa, 869. Uh, meteorites get the name of the place where they were found. So the Peekskill meteorite was found in Peekskill, New York. The Weston meteorite and Ensisheim, they were found those days. Northwest Africa has this vague name because these are found by nomads out in the Sahara. And they've become smart to know that if they see a black rock on top of the sand, it's probably a meteorite, so they stash it in their camel pouch. And when they get to Tripoli or whatever, wherever they get, they know that there are people there that are willing to buy these stones and give them a lot of money for it. This is a carbonaceous chondrite rich in carbon and other things like organic molecules. Even amino acids have been found in some of these meteorites. This one fell and was seen to fall in Murchison, Australia. 1969 was a great year for planetary science. We had astronauts that went to the moon and brought us back samples of what the moon looked like. And there were not one, but two really important meteorite falls. This one and another carbonaceous chondrite in, uh, in Mexico, the little town of Allende. Very important scientifically because 
They're carbonaceous, so they're very, very primitive. They have all this interesting stuff inside, and you want to get them right away before they get contaminated by the Earth, right? So it was very, very important scientifically. Now, I mentioned those eight chondrites that have melted. Imagine a big asteroid out in the asteroid belt, and it is it contains all kinds of stuff, all kinds of rock, metals, and uh, radioactive elements, right? And, and those those radioactive elements gradually heat up the asteroid until it melts. Now, who likes Italian salad dressing on their salads? Anybody besides me? Okay, now I want you to imagine that you've got your uh, obligatory bottle of good season salad dressing, right? And you shake it up, right? So everything's mixed up, and then you put it in the freezer and it flash freezes. You take it out of the freezer and it's still all mixed up, right? Right? That's a chondrite. Now, I set it on the counter, and I let that ice melt, that frozen salad dressing melt. What happens to it? Say it loud enough. It separates into layers, right, according to density. And when an asteroid melts all the way through, it settles out. Earth has done that because Earth got hot enough to melt, and it settled out. So all of, most of the iron in the Earth is in its core, and that's what happened to asteroids. They, they, ended up with this sort of layered arrangement with iron in the core, then denser silicates, and then lighter silicates, kind of like a layer cake, kind of like an onion. But then, unlike the Earth, they got smashed to bits, many of them. And so pieces went flying all over the solar system, the, this part, this part, and this part. And so back on the table, though, you're, you'll, you probably saw some asteroids that feel very heavy, almost like they're completely made of iron, and they are. And they're from the core of an asteroid that got smashed apart into pieces. So that's where we get most of our achondrites. This is what, uh, this, and actually these iron meteorites, as they're called, are very common and very affordable. One of the most common is called Campo de Cielo. It fell in Argentina uh, roughly 1,500 years ago. It exists down there by the tons. It's scattered all over the landscape. You can buy a piece of, if you just go online, right, do not buy meteorites on eBay. But if you go online, you'll find respectable meteorite dealers who will sell you a piece of compo for about, depending on how big, 50 cents to a dollar per gram. So, so for, for less than $100, you can get a pretty good sized meteorite, right? That you can keep on your mantle, please. They make dandy paperweights. <laughs> this is a slightly different kind. So remember this. Right? So now imagine this is the iron core, and then this is a denser kind of silicate sort of mantle. This is called a palisite, and it is from that core mantle boundary inside. There is metal there for sure, but the light green stuff is the mineral olivine, which has crystallized. It's, it's a beautiful, very highly prized uh, meteorites. I have one small slice of it that's kind of beat up back there. It's a thin slice, kind of like a, a piece of uh, biscuit. You can hold it up to the light and you can see the olivine crystals back there. So, what we've come to realize is that there are asteroids from other places besides the asteroid belt, believe it or not. We have been to the moon. When you look at the moon, it's very pretty and the moon has a lot of craters on it. And each time you see a crater, that's a place where something has hit the moon really hard. And the moon has an escape velocity of only about, uh, if I'm remembering this right, uh, less than two miles per second. 1.4 is the number that sticks in my head. So if something is hitting it at 10 to 15 to 20 miles per second, which is common for an impact velocity, it's not hard to imagine things getting flung off of the moon so that they escape and never come back again. And so there should be pieces of the moon lying on the Earth. When, when we went there with our astronauts, we saw craters all over the place. A crater this size could have left junk uh, escaping the moon. And of course, now we know what pieces of the moon are like, what their composition is. In many ways, they're like the Earth. In many ways, they're not. They don't have much water in them, for example. And it turns out a great place to collect meteorites is Antarctica. And the reasons are a little bit complicated, but just like the Sahara, you know, Antarctica is this vast ice field. And so if you come across something that's black, right, it wasn't there to begin with. It fell from the sky. And so this has become a very, uh, re a very uh, great place 
to, to go hunting for meteorites. NASA and the National Science Foundation send a team there every, every summer, which is winter for us, summer for them. Uh, the Japanese go, the Chinese go, the Europeans go. They all go down there hunting for meteorites because they're such, they're such low-hanging fruit, in a sense. So this is a sample of, back in 1979, the first meteorite collected that proved to be from the moon. This is another one. And this, you can notice, notice this interesting character with these large white chunks. These white chunks, um, you're going to hear about Apollo 11 in the coming weeks. Um, those white chunks are a kind of mineral called anorthite, which is very rare on the Earth. It's a very low-density silicate. Think of it as rock froth, right? Like the foam on the top of your lattes. And when uh, Apollo astronauts brought back their samples, Apollo 11, a team from here at, 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 the, at the Smithsonian uh, campus in Cambridge discovered these white things and said, holy cow, the moon must have been totally molten and separated so that this rock froth ended up on top. It was the first time that we had proof that the moon had actually been hot. Most people thought that the moon assembled cold, kind of like those chondrite meteorites, but no, Meteorites like this and, and samples like that prove that uh, the, the moon was hot. So there, we know of a bunch of lunar meteorites now. We now know what to look for. This is, uh, they're, they're pretty common. And in fact, thinking more broadly, there should be meteorites on the Earth from Mars. Now, Mars has a solid surface. Um, what you see on Mars as the dark areas are actually plains of lava. So we know that much of Mars has a, an igneous exterior. And Mars has, a, has a, uh, an escape velocity of about three or four miles per second. So again, there should be pieces of rock flying off of Mars. This is what its surface looks like. There's all kinds of rocks on the surface of Mars. Some of them are even meteorites that have fallen onto Mars. But these are all volcanic rocks that you see there. And so you can easily imagine them being blasted to Earth. Well, the first confirmed, we, we didn't know it in 1911 when it fell in, uh, in Egypt. But this, this particular meteorite called Nakla, uh, now we now know came from Mars. It's an igneous rock. It's an achondrite. It has been melted. And there aren't, if you think about it, there aren't that, plenty, that many places in the solar system that have uh, uh, igneous rocks on their surfaces, right? If there's Mars, there's the Earth, Venus, and Mercury, not Jupiter, because it's a gas giant, and so forth. Here is another. This was a witness fall in Zagami in Nigeria. Uh, a lot of this material fell. Meteorites have this very interesting characteristic. As they come through the atmosphere, they're flying in so fast that their outermost uh, exterior gets superheated to thousands of degrees. And they create a, what's called a fusion crust. Very quickly, they get sort of seared on the outside. But the inside, the inside, it's such a rapid process. They decelerate so quickly that these, these hit the atmosphere at like 50 miles up. They slow down, and then they just drop. Well, you know that the upper atmosphere is very cold, right? So if I, drop an, if I drop a rock from 50 miles above the ground and let it fall to the ground, what temperature is it going to be when it hits? It's going to be cold. It's not going to be hot. It's going to be cold. So if somebody, if you hear a report that somebody found a meteorite in their backyard and it started a fire, that is not a meteorite. That's somebody looking for publicity. I get calls like that all the time. So Zagami, because it is from Mars, is a very special meteorite, and it's very expensive. I mentioned that a piece of compo, right, uh, ordinary everyday iron meteorite is maybe 50 cents a gram. Uh, this is more like uh, $500 a gram, and that's a little tiny piece. The cube is one centimeter on a side, so this is a little more than an inch long, and it's a piece that sold for $3,500. All right. So, we, we have now tallied, this is a little bit dated, but it's about right. You would think that there should be more meteorites on the Earth from the Moon than from Mars, because it's closer and lower gravity and so forth. But it turns out that the, roughly the same number of meteorites have fallen on Earth that we've found, anyway, uh, from those two bodies. This is the total count of meteorites, of all meteorites found from all sources. And again, the uh, the, the ordinary chondrites are far and away the most common. But the iron stony ones are, are the most obvious. As you see back there uh, on the table, 
A stony meteorite is exactly that. It's like a stone. It's usually brown. If you kicked one on the street, you probably wouldn't recognize it. But if you kicked a two-pound chunk of iron with your toe, you'd probably notice that. And that's how most of the iron meteorites get found, because they're so different. OK, so that's the scorecard. Um, so how did these meteorites get here from the asteroid belt? They don't, like, like Chelyabinsk, they have orbits that are quite elongated. They, they, are, they are on a kind of uh, collision course with the inner planets, if you will. And it wasn't very early, it wasn't very long after asteroids started being discovered that uh, a fellow by the name James Kirkwood noticed that there are places uh, where there are no asteroids in orbit. The semi-major axis is based on one equals the, the, uh, the, the distance of Earth from the Sun. So this is 2.2 times that, 2.4, 2.6, 2.8. .2 this is all between Mars and Jupiter. And he realized that there are places where there are no asteroids. There, and, and even now, with a much better sample, we see that there are these places that are kind of asteroid-free. And the reason is that these are places where those orbits in the asteroids, they have a resonance just like Pluto and Neptune, they have a resonance with the planet Jupiter. And Jupiter is the 600-pound gorilla of the solar system, right? It has a lot of gravity. It has its way with a lot of things. And it literally perturbs the orbits of these asteroids so that they cannot occupy those spaces. This is 2 to 1, meaning an asteroid here would go around the sun twice in the time it takes Jupiter. This is 5 for 2, 3 for 1. And it gets rid of them all. It scatters them away. And in the process of scattering them away, some of them get scattered onto these eccentric orbits that cross the Earth. There are a couple of other ways that an asteroid can move. Uh, this is a little bit complicated. And I won't spend much time. But um, imagine that you are uh, rotating, and you're in sunlight, right? You're an asteroid body. And when noon comes, you're facing the sun directly. This actually applies to the Earth as well. Is the hottest time on a summer day noon or 1 o'clock? No, it's later in the afternoon, right? Usually 3 or 4 o'clock, because that's when it's absorbed most sunlight. So these asteroids, they, they, they radiate away most of their energy sort of in the afternoon time. And that radiation is like a little gentle push. And so asteroids, if they're spinning one way or the other, they can change their orbits, either increasing or decreasing their distance from the sun over a long time. There are a couple of different ways that works. I, I won't get to it. So, these asteroids have a couple of different delivery mechanisms for getting to the Earth, and sometimes they do hit the Earth and they do make craters. Now, this is the audience participation portion. Many of you have seen the moon through a, a, a telescope, and it's covered with craters. There are like 6,000 craters on the moon. We only know of about 250 impact craters on the Earth. But what if I told you that Earth should actually have more craters than the moon does per unit area? Earth should be more heavily cratered than the Earth. I'm sorry, Earth, Earth should be more heavily cratered than the Moon, sorry. Who thinks, there are at least three reasons why. Anybody have an idea? Go ahead. Weathering. I'm sorry? Weathering. Weathering, yes, and that is the biggest reason, right? What's another reason? A lot of water. A lot of water, right. And what were you going to guess? The oceans. No, it's, it's people like us going around and picking them up. See, we, no, it's, weathering is the biggest one, right? Weathering is, is really a big deal. Also, we have shifting crustal plates, right? So even if you form a big one in the ocean, it's eventually going to get sucked into the mantle of the Earth. So that's why we don't have very many. There are a couple of places that are, there are famous places where Earth, where Earth has been hit. One is in Siberia, where on June 30th, 1908, uh, something with the energy of 10 million megatons maybe 50 meters across. 50 meters is like 180 feet, right? So think of Town Hall as colliding over, the, over Siberia. It leveled hundreds of square miles of trees. It actually was an event. It's so sparsely populated there that people didn't realize that it had happened for decades. And the Moscow Academy of Sciences, the Russian Academy of Sciences, eventually sent a team who took these pictures and even this were, this were taken in the 1930s, even 30 years after the fact. There were all these trees that were knocked down. This was the pattern of the, of the fallen trees that they discovered. And they, so they figured there must be an epicenter there. They worked for decades trying to dig out a crater there, uh, the original object there, and they never found it. And what seems to have happened is that it exploded in the atmosphere before it got to the ground. 
And, and so this is, this is, you can see the scale here. This is about 15 miles long. Uh, this is that same area over, say, London. So you can imagine if that had happened over a populated center like London instead of over Siberia, uh, there would have been a tremendous amount of damage and loss of life. So that's what we try to guard against these days. Here's a famous crater near the Grand Canyon, uh, east of Flagstaff, called Meteor Crater. It's about a half a mile across. Uh, when that happened about 50,000 years ago, it's been preserved because it's out in the desert. It was a bad day. This is a sequence of images that kind of give you a sense of what would happen. There's a tremendous shock wave, craters left. Uh, again, this is a scale, this is 20 miles here. So inside this 20 mile radius, everything would be incinerated in a fireball. Out here, large animals would be killed or wounded, and out here, to this, out to a distance of 25 miles from the center, there would be hurricane force winds. So, getting back to our town hall scenario, if the town hall were a meteorite or asteroid fragment that was gonna hit that spot in Chelmsford, I would wanna be out of this state completely to escape any damage. Uh, they can be very, very devastating. Here's another uh, meteorite cra a meteor a crater on the Earth this is uh, 40 miles across, 200 million years old. And then the biggie was 65 million years ago uh, on the northern tip of the Yucatan Peninsula. This is the one that did in the dinosaurs. Um, and this is a sort of, it was uh, roughly six to eight miles across, huge by standards. There aren't very many asteroids that big that cross the Earth's orbit, but this one hit us, right? And, and uh, astronomers never, th there wasn't an obvious crater. And they kind of piece the story together from deposits of, of disturbed soil and stuff all around the, the Caribbean region. Finally, um, the Mexican petroleum company, Pemex, um, uh, requested an American geophysicist to do flights with a plane back and forth with a magnetometer over looking for oil deposits. And he found this multi-ring structure on the uh, tip of the Yucatan Peninsula. There's this 30 miles across here. And that is where that killer, uh, that killer asteroid that almost wiped, it certainly did in the dinosaurs and eradicated 90% of all living species on the Earth. Anyway, so there's, a, there's a, a, a scale here, right? We're gonna get hit by something as big as that dinosaur killer only once in about 100 million years. That's the scale, right? Because when they hit, they do tremendous amount of damage. Something like Tunguska, maybe once in a thousand years. And this sort of gives you a scale of the diameter here. A hundred meters is close to a hundred yards. And so the, the smaller they are, the less powerful they are, but the more often they happen. Like Chelyabinsk, for example, was small, still powerful, and maybe that's once every 50 years. So uh, this, is the, this is the math that goes into that. A one kilometer object, right? happens about one per million, one every million years. So the chance of that happening is one in a million every year. It's a random thing. It's a random statistic. It's like winning the megabucks, right? It's, it, your chance is the same every time. And just because a million years have gone by, I mean, or, you know, it's been like 100,000 years since the last one, you could have another hit any time. And so, uh, the chance of something, uh, well, so, the, so then the question becomes, all right, so what are the chances, the odds, that your tombstone will say killed by an asteroid? And this is a plot that shows that. Here's a Tunguska-like impact and the number of people that might be killed per event. This is global catastrophe. This is like the, the, uh, the uh, one in a hundred million year event. So up here they're rarer and down here they're more common. But here, look how much more likely you are to be killed in by electrocution or murder or a car accident. And, and these are, these are uh, this is the probability of death, and it's also the probability of, of happening. So this is, again, audience participation, okay? You get in your car, and you turn on the ignition, you're gonna go to work or the store or whatever, and the announcer on the radio says, what's your name? Margaret. Margaret you have a one in a thousand chance of dying in a car accident if you go to the store. Do you still go to the store? Who would still go to the store? One in a thousand chance. The announcer says, Margaret, one in a hundred chance you're gonna die in a car accident. Who would still go? A few of you. 
Okay, all right, what's your name? Barbara, Barbara there's a one in 10 chance you're gonna get killed. Do you, does anybody still go? All right, now let's turn the tables. Margaret, what's your friend's name here? Adam? Al. Al. So you get on a plane, you're gonna fly someplace on vacation, and the pilot comes on and says, Al, there's a one in 10,000 chance, 10,000, that this plane is gonna crash and we're all gonna die. Do you still take the flight? Who, takes the, who still takes the flight? Pilot says, one in 1,000 chance you're gonna die. Who still takes the flight? Ooh, not very many. One in 100 chance. Anybody still take the flight? You take the train. But, but here's the thing. More of you are afraid to take the same risk on a plane than in a car, if you notice the show of hands. That's because when you're in the car, you think you control your destiny. The odds are what the odds are. You're either going to die one in a hundred or not. So the odds are always the same. And in fact, flying is a whole lot safer than driving a car, just, just saying. OK, so a few years ago, well, it's been about 20 years now, uh, an MIT professor, a professor from the University of Arizona, and me uh, got together. And we devised this thing called the Torino scale, which is kind of like the Richter scale for asteroid impacts. The chances, uh, it was a simple numerical scale that uh, gave you a sense of uh, what the probability of the collision is. This is log, so this is 1 in a million, 1 in, uh, in 10,000, 1 in 100, almost certain against the energy, right? And so the higher the energy, the greater the chance of widespread devastation. So zero is good, and 10 is like, kiss it goodbye, because we're all going to die. And so um, uh, this has been used to, uh, this is the, the full details of, of what each of those steps means, right? And it turns out that as astronomers have discovered more and more asteroids that are crossing the orbit of the Earth, these near-Earth asteroids, you can see we know we now have more than 20,000 near-Earth asteroids. Uh, a good fraction of those are above 140 kilometers. That's I mean, I'm sorry, 140 meters. That's roughly 500 feet across. One kilometer is enough to wipe wipe out a continent. 140 would wipe out New England, right? Uh, so there aren't, fortunately, there aren't very many in that one kilometer class. There's quite a few in 140. Congress has actually mandated that NASA and others find all of the 140 meter asteroids that can hit, hit the Earth by next year. They're only a third of the way there. They're not going to make that deadline. But they're working on it. Within, within a decade, we might know where all of them are. And so once we know where all of them are and we know their orbits, we can predict when in the future they might hit us. So this is a plot based on time going forward, right, of the chance of these. This is the designation of that object. This is kind of a shorthand. The, the number tells you the year that this asteroid was discovered. These are all asteroids, right? This is their estimated diameter in kilometers. So 1.2 kilometers, that's not quite one mile across. And so this is the cumulative probability that they, they are going to hit the Earth. And this is like one chance in 10 million. Right? You can see there aren't any real low numbers here, big numbers. But let's reorder this according to the chance of hitting. There are a couple of objects here that have within this this time frame, this is like a one in a thousand chance of hitting the Earth. And it's a pretty good size object. It's 160 meters across, right? But one in a thousand, that means there's a 999 chance out of a thousand that it's going to miss us. I call your attention to a couple of objects here, Bennu and uh, Apophis. Apophis is a pretty good sized object. It has only a, a sort of one in a hundred thousand chance. But as it turns out, on April 13th, 2029, it's going to pass really close to the Earth, within 20,000 miles. It'll be bright enough to be seen in the sky as it whizzes by, right? So make sure it's clear that night, or go someplace where it's clear that night. 2029, still a decade away. Um, Hayabusa, I mentioned Hayabusa 2, its successor, has gone off to visit uh, a near-Earth asteroid called Ryugu. Uh, by the way, asteroids are named uh, by the discoverers, okay? So Al, if you discover an asteroid, 
you can name it Barbara. It's cool. You can't name it after yourself, but you can name it Barbara. Right? And what's your name? Hannah. Hannah. If Hannah discovers a comet, it gets named after her. Comet Hannah has a nice ring to it, don't you think? Right? So that's how the, this name game works. Uh, and so this is what Ryugu looks like up close because the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft has gone to visit it, not just visit it, but to collect a sample and bring it back to Earth. And this is a movie of the arm of Hayabusa. This is a shadow of the spacecraft here. It's zooming in on the surface and it's about to collect a sample. This is just five months ago. Hundreds of millions of miles away from us. It comes in contact. The, the gravity is very low. It slams into the surface. It backs away. And look at all this stuff flying away, right? And some of it went up into the collection uh, canister for Hayabusa. You can see its shadow here as it re recedes away. And it's still in orbit around that asteroid, but soon it will make its way back to Earth so that we can study those pieces. This is another asteroid, Bennu. This was on that list I showed you. And this were, these were the discovery images of it. Uh, asteroid, I, I'm sorry, I stand corrected. This was not uh, the discovery images. This is just a telescopic image taken last year as it was crossing the sky. It did come close to the Earth in 1999, close enough for radar, our big radio dishes to send radar pulses and bounce radar echoes off of it. This is very diagnostic. It tells us the diameter uh, and tells us something of the surface composition. This is a, an asteroid that could hit the Earth someday. This is what it looks like up close, because NASA has sent a spacecraft called OSIRIS-REx, uh, which is there now. It's in orbit, and it, too, is going to sample this asteroid and bring samples of it back to the Earth. It hasn't done that yet, uh, but the sampling is going to take place pretty soon. It's got this interesting shape. Both this and Ryugu have this sort of diamond shape that are very fat around the equator. We don't quite understand why that is, but you can see it's a very rubbly surface. Look at the size of this big boulder sitting on the surface here as it rotates around. Very, very cool. We've never seen an asteroid quite like these two. OK, so this is, this is an a, a artist's concept of it taking its sample. Now, a little further into the future, if this mission hasn't been funded yet, uh, NASA is going to launch a spacecraft. Turns out that lots of asteroids are, have a moon around them. And that's really helpful because that moon tells us the mass. If you know how long it takes the moon to go around, and if you know how far away it is, that very easily, eighth grade mathematics, tells you how massive the middle object is. And so what, we're gonna, what NASA is going to do is send a spacecraft crashing into this object, the moon. And that's going to change its orbit from this original orbit to some new orbit. We don't know what it is. But because we can watch the new orbit, we'll know exactly how much energy we delivered, right? Did we make a, a just a little, did we make a difference at all or did we make a, a substantial change in the orbit? Because these asteroids, that big table of asteroids that I showed you, if we find one that's going to hit the Earth, chances are it's not going to hit us for decades like Apophis, right? A decade from now, it's going to come close to the Earth. At one point, we weren't sure whether it was going to hit or not. Now we know it's not going to hit. But if it is going to hit, and if it's still decades in the future, all you need to do is give it a little push, just a little push. And over that time, it will change its orbit enough that it will miss us. And a miss is good. It misses, any kind of miss is good. There are other ways that we've thought of for making these changes. This is something called an orbital tr a gravity tractor. So this is a spaceship and the asteroid. They're attracting each other, right? And they want to come together. But the tractor is kind of pulling away, so the asteroid kind of follows. And so in a very passive way, we change the orbit of the asteroid without ever touching it. It's possible to do. This is, this is what's really going to happen if we ever discover an asteroid. Chances are we'll have decades of forewarning, and we'll have plenty of time to find a new place to live besides somewhere near Town Hall. Right? What is unlikely to happen is, and in, as in the movie Armageddon, some backyard astronomer, maybe me, 
looks up through my telescope and suddenly discovers an asteroid the size of Texas that somehow no one had ever seen before. <laughs> and it's going to collide with the Earth in two weeks. Right? And so what do you do? Right? Obviously, you send Bruce Willis to save the day. And of course, the nuclear bomb conveniently splits the asteroid exactly in two. And the two halves miss Earth because one goes on either side, right? Everyone have, have most of you seen Armageddon, right? And I left out the part where the waiting crowds around the world are cheering, right? Um, that's not what's going to happen, right? If you want to see an asteroid impact movie that's really pretty well grounded in science, it's Deep Impact. Deep Impact. Um, you told me that the reason we don't find very many craters is that the Earth is covered with water. And so the most likely place for an, an, a threatening asteroid to hit is in the ocean. That doesn't get us out of trouble because that creates an enormous tsunami of unprecedented proportions. Right? That's what happened for the KT impact, the one that did the dinosaurs in. It created a, a, a tsunami that washed rubble up all over the, the Western Hemisphere. And so deep impact, the plot line is that the, the impact takes place off the eastern coast and creates a tsunami that washes up the eastern seaboard. Great movie. Great. Much better than. So when you see something like this, please remember this talk, and it really isn't nearly as dire as you think it is. Thank you all very much. OK. So we have any questions? You've all been pretty good about holding your questions, but let's have them. Let's play Stump the Astronomer. In the past week, I saw a number of articles about the discovery of a large iron core inside yes. the moon that they, some people speculate was the remains of an asteroid. Sure, and it, and it, it probably is. Um, so this is, um, uh, there is unseen on the side of the moon that we can see. You know the moon always keeps one hemisphere facing us. We can't see the back side. It's not the dark side. It's the, the far side. And this big basin is on the far side. And by every, when you have spacecraft going around the moon, if there's a big concentration of mass, as you track the asteroid, it, uh, the spacecraft, it will speed up as it gets close by and then slow down as it passes over it. So that's how they detected this big mass under what's called the South Pole Aitken Basin. It's the largest impact basin that we know of on the moon. And there has been a suggestion for a long time that it was a grazing impact, which tends to not obliterate the object necessarily. And so the thought is they have discovered this really large mass uh, that, that could be metallic because it's very massive. So it makes sense that it might be something metallic. And there's no way to prove that. Uh, you might. so riffing on that for just a second, this giant basin, just within the last few months, a country has placed a roving vehicle inside that basin, inside a crater within that basin. Anybody know who it is? China. China. So the Chinese have had now three landers on the moon. And this one, they were so clever. You're, this is where you say, well, wait, if it's on the far side of the moon, how do we get communication from it because we're out of radio contact. They sent a second spacecraft that is positioned beyond the moon that takes the, the information and radios it back to Earth. So clever. I wish I'd thought of it. And so, um, and so that, that is an area of discovery. If we were able to bring back a sample from that basin, right? we, we think that it's, it's, a, it's a thousand kilometers across, 600 miles across. It's so big and was so powerful, we think it actually dredged up part of the moon's mantle. And so that would be very useful to know that what the moon's mantle was made of. Yeah, great question. Others? Yes? Was the moon an asteroid? Was the moon an asteroid? Well, not exactly. But we think the moon was created 
when something roughly the size of Mars, which is very half the size of the Earth, hit us when Earth was very young, and you created a really big splat, right? A lot of material got ejected out into space. Not all of it escaped, enough of it hung around nearby that it could collect and into a one single object that we now call the moon. So the moon could have been born because something hit the Earth. Probably was born because something hit the Earth. And this would explain, for example, I won't go into the details, but it would explain why, for example, there's no water on the moon, because all of that stuff that got ejected would have been so superheated hot that any water would have escaped. But the moon and the Earth have very similar compositions in many ways, uh, suggesting to astronomers that they had to have had a common origin one way or the other. Great question. Others? Yes? Is there any way to know going backwards how big meteorites are before they burn off, whatever they do yeah. before they hit? Yeah, absolutely. That's a very, so her question is, is there any way to know how big it was before it hit? So in the case of Chelyabinsk, for example, we can take the energy that we saw it dissipating in the atmosphere and calculate how much energy that was, 440 kilotons, yep, based on how bright it got, right? Just based on how much light it gave off, that tells us how much energy is being dissipated in the atmosphere. We know how fast it was coming in, we know where it came from, and you can run it backward and figure out how big the object was that came in in the first place. It turns out about 50 feet across. I'm, I'm going to shock you. There are satellites in orbit launched by our government and other governments that are looking for rocket launches on the Earth. They are, they are our advanced early warning system, right? And it turns out that we see the Earth beautifully out the window of our spaceship, but if we could look at the infrared wavelength of seven microns, at seven microns, water vapor strongly absorbs radiation. And so all the water vapor in our atmosphere absorbs every bit of, of energy at seven microns. If you look at the Earth at seven microns in the infrared, it is black, at least as far as the atmosphere goes. If you happen to launch a rocket and it gets above the atmosphere, it looks like a supernova against that black Earth. And so these satellites scan the Earth constantly, look, waiting for rocket launches, but they're also dandy dandy at recording big meteorite strikes in our atmosphere. And that Defense Department data is telling us how often and how powerful we get hit by objects from outer space, what the distribution is. And thank you for reminding me, because I need to add that plot. I, I meant to add that plot to this talk, and I didn't. How many sort of Chelyabinsk scale impacts have happened over the last couple of decades. It's actually quite a few, quite a few. Yes, sir? Um, do we know enough about the number of objects in the Kuiper Belt to know whether or not there's more there than in the asteroid belt? Uh, great, great question. So the Kuiper Belt is that body of icy bodies out beyond Neptune that includes Neptune. The asteroid belt is rocky bodies, though they sometimes have water uh, associated with them between Mars and Jupiter. We know uh, that the Kuiper Belt is probably more. Uh, and, and the only reason we can't prove that yet is because it's so much farther away, we can only see the really big objects, right, that are like maybe 10 or 20 miles across. Whereas asteroids, because they're so much closer to the sun, they look brighter through our telescopes. And so we can see them down to about the size of this room, right? So, so that's. We can see all the, and there's a, a gradation. For every big one, there's lots of middle ones and, and a, a, like a slew of really tiny ones. And the same should be true in the Kuiper Belt. Uh, and so this is one of the reasons why the New Horizons spacecraft, which passed Pluto in 2015, has gone on. Its job is to, it has already passed one Kuiper Belt object, and it hopes to see another one. This is our, you know, it's our best chance to actually get us chance to see what these things look like firsthand, and there probably are a great many of them. And the one it passed uh, in January, called in shorthand is MU69, was small. It was only a, a few miles across, and it could only be found with the Hubble telescope, because they needed to find an object along, it, along the spacecraft's path, and it, it tells us that there must be a great many of them at small sizes. <laughs>
Sir, you had a question? Yeah, aren't a lot of these meteorites uh, from the tail of comets? Ah, so great question. Are, are meteorites from the tail of comets? Well, so um, let me back up a step. All right? If you go out on a clear night and look up in the sky, every once in a while, on average, seven times an hour from a really dark location, you're going to see a meteor go across the sky. This is small stuff. It's the size of grape nut cereal, little tiny particles. And every once in a while, there'll be a very, a a very uh, bright one, but these are what we call sporadic meteors. These are just little bits of interplanetary debris, mostly asteroid, right, floating around in space. A few times every year, we cross the path of a comet. And then we get a meteor shower. We actually get a concentration of meteors. Some of you have heard about the Perseid meteor shower that comes in August. There's also the Geminids in December, the Quadrantids in, in, um, in uh, January. And you're going to hear, you might hear something in the next couple of weeks about a kind of meteor shower called the Taurids, T-A-U-R-I-D, from the constellation Taurus. There, there is a, a paper out. I just wrote an article on it. If you go to the Sky and Telescope website and look me up, I wrote an article about this torrid shower. It possibly is a comet that broke up, a gigantic comet that broke up about 20,000 years ago and has left big chunks of stuff in its orbit. And we know what the orbit is, so we ought to be able to find these things. And it turns out the concentration should be coming past the Earth uh, beginning now through August. And so astronomers in the Southern Hemisphere are going to be looking for it. To your question, comets are icy and rocky, and so they tend to not have big, massive chunks come off of them. The meteor showers that we see are still pretty small particles, right? And it is certainly true that a comet could hit the Earth, because they do come close to the Earth uh, and, and could strike us. But proportionately, there are many, many, many more asteroids in this category, and all the meteorites that we have all those tens of thousands of meteorites came from asteroids. We have no, not a single meteorite that we can say, oh, wow, this must have come from a comet. They, they just break up. They're, they're a lot more fragile, and, and they, they burn up high in the atmosphere. How about one more question, and we'll call it a night. In the back. A question on the date of the rocks of the asteroids that come down. Great question. How, how do we know how old they are? Well, there's a couple of different ages at play. Let's take a rock that came from Mars as an example. All right? It's an igneous rock. So there must have been some date when it formed from magma and became solid. That's one date. And we usually use uh, things like uh, uh, potassium argon dating, which has uh, uh, isotopes of these two that, that once you know, potassium can be a radioactive element, and once you lock it up in a rock, you cannot add or subtract potassium. So if you find that it has decayed to argon, you know how long it's been doing that, you can tell the age. Then there is the ejection age. When did it get blasted off the surface of Mars? And we can tell that because usually the, 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 the impact creates shock within the crystals of the rock, and releases some of that argon, and so we can tell the, the, the shock age. And it turns out that some of the meteorites from Mars were as recent as like 180 million years ago. And then the final age is how long have they been floating around in space to get to Earth? It's, it's, on paper, it's like tens of millions of years. We can tell because when you're in space, you're exposed to cosmic rays. And we know what the rate of cosmic rays is, and we know how deep they should penetrate into the rock, right? So if you see how much cosmic ray damage there is, or how much the outer surface of it has been discolored by exposure to radiation, you can estimate how long it took to get from Mars after it was ejected to Earth. So there's actually three dates involved in a case like Mars. And they're all very interesting. They're all very diagnostic. So for example, this is another talk for another time. Um, some astronomers have, have thrown out the idea that because Mars became a, 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 a cooled off, reasonably habitable place before the Earth did, and because it's easier to get meteorites off the surface of Mars and get them to Earth than vice versa, maybe we were seeded with life from Mars 
a, a, a concept called panspermia. Panspermia. And so when you think about that possibility, if you're going to eject a rock off of Mars that makes it all the way to Earth, it has to be a big enough rock to protect the life inside from all the cosmic rays for a long enough period of time. It turns out that the rock has to be at least a couple of meters across, about this big, in order for the center to be protected over tens of millions of years from space radiation. A great talk for another time. Um, and in fact, I think the third talk this summer okay. yeah. is the Thursday, August the third, I think it's the third Thursday in August. About searching for life elsewhere. So I hope to see you back then. Thanks again, everyone. Don't forget to have a peek at the meteorites. One of them is not a real meteorite. See if you can figure it out. Come and ask me, and I will tell you if you're right or wrong. Thank you. This was fantastic. Oh, you're welcome.